This documentary is the result of extensive research, looking at the life and mind of Theodore Robert Bundy, to try and understand what drives an outwardly normal man to commit some of the most heinous acts ever recorded on innocent young girls who had their whole lives ahead of them. Some of the names have been changed to protect those who do not wish to be associated with what Bundy did. Some of the grotesque acts he performed on his victims have also been toned down. But the accounts are true, and the events surrounding the murders are as accurate as possible. But in truth, ultimately, there is only one person who knows what really happened. And thankfully, he is no longer with us. Theodore Robert Cowell was born in Burlington, Vermont on the 24th of November 1946. His mother Louise was unmarried, and her pregnancy was the result of a fling with a sailor called Jack Worthington, who abandoned her once he learned of her condition. In 1946, it was not considered acceptable to bear a child out of wedlock, and Louise opted to give birth in the Elizabeth Lund home for unwed mothers. The delivery was uneventful, and Ted was a normal healthy baby. Soon after birth, Louise returned to her family in Philadelphia, who despite the stigma at the time, welcomed her and her baby back into their home. However, it's thought that for a period of time during his childhood, Ted believed his grandparents were his mother and father, and his mother was his sister. It was also thought that although Ted spoke fondly of his grandfather, it was rumored that there was a far darker side to him a side that the venerable young Ted was exposed to from an early age. His grandfather had a violent temper that often culminated in physical violence, and was known to be abusive to animals. He also had a disturbing collection of pornography that young Ted had discovered and viewed from a very young age. Family members remember that Ted displayed some very unusual behaviours even as a young child. On one occasion, when he was just three years old, his aunt woke to find Ted had placed kitchen knives all around her body as she slept. He was also known to scare family members with his sudden personality change, when for no reason he could turn from a sweet little boy into an unrecognisable entity. In 1949, Ted's mother inexplicably changed her son's surname from Cowell to Nelson. Many years later, Louise revealed the reason for this was that she intended on moving out of the family home to live with her uncle, Jack, in Washington. His surname was also Cowell, so to protect her son from ridicule, she decided to change it. In 1951, Louise and Ted moved in with Uncle Jack, and the boy became quite close to him. It wasn't long before Louise met and married John Bundy, a war veteran and cook. He soon adopted Ted, who took his now infamous surname. After a brief move to the country, the family later settled in Tacoma, where Bundy spent the rest of his childhood. His mother's union with John bore a further four children, two daughters and two sons. Ted had a good relationship with all of his siblings, but was closest to his youngest brother Richard and his mother. His relationship with his stepfather was fractious, and the more intelligent Ed often clashed with him sometimes resulting in physical violence. This friction intensified when Ted learned the truth about his illegitimate birth, when he stumbled upon his birth certificate that stated his father was unknown. This discovery implanted a bitterness and resentment in Ted's mind that remained with him for the rest of his life. Ted's years in school were fairly uneventful, although from a very young age, he had an unhealthy interest in sex. As he progressed to high school, he became somewhat of a loner, who had just a couple of friends. He found it hard to adapt, and was becoming increasingly isolated and out of place in the society he lived in. However, despite being socially withdrawn with a few friends, he was never short of female admirers. 
Although much to their displeasure, he never dated through high school. As he entered adulthood, he became more and more attracted to the opposite sex. He was good looking, charming and intelligent, but this outer shell was hiding an increasingly tortured mind, and Bundy saw himself as a loser and an outsider. During his high school years, Bundy was a keen sportsman, and although his achievements were limited, he did become an accomplished skier. He also became an accomplished thief, and as money was tight in the family, he would regularly steal things he needed, in particular his skiing equipment. In 1965, Bundy graduated from high school and enrolled at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, although he became bored and lonely and the following year enrolled at the University of Washington in Seattle. It was here that he met the girl of his dreams. Her name was Stephanie Brooks. Stephanie was slightly older than Bundy and of a much higher social standing than him. But despite this, they became an item. Bundy was infatuated with Stephanie and was desperate to impress her. But inwardly, he felt he was not worthy of her. Although he had this remarkable ability to hide his inner turmoil, Stephanie finally ended the relationship in 1968, and this is when Bundy's already fractured mind began to unravel. He decided to leave Seattle and university, telling family members the memories were too painful and he needed to get away. Bundy left Washington State in the winter of 1968 and headed to San Francisco before flying to Denver to ski and then Philadelphia to visit family. He later returned to Seattle to try and piece his life back together but by now, the breakup had taken an irretrievable toll, and Bundy's mask of charm and respectability was hiding a very disturbed character. On his return to Seattle, Bundy worked a couple of jobs, first in a Safeway store, then in a hotel washing pots, a job he left under a cloud due to allegations of stealing. Then, after a chance meeting with an old friend, he started working for Art Felcher, a city councilman who was campaigning to be nominated for the Republican Lieutenant Governor. He worked hard and was liked by everyone. However, similar to other stages in his life, he found it difficult to form any real friendships. When Fletcher lost his bid to be Lieutenant Governor, it was a crashing blow to Bundy, who had aspirations of becoming more involved in political life. By now, Bundy's inner monster was beginning to surface, and he had become a prolific peeping Tom creeping around at night, spying on unsuspecting women. He also had an extreme obsession with violent pornography. With his political ambitions hampered, Bundy decided to return to education, and in January 1969, he enrolled at Temple University in Philadelphia. By now, the dark thoughts in his mind were out of control, and he was getting increasingly drawn to act out his desire to abduct and rape a woman. It's uncertain whether he did murder any women in Philadelphia, although many believe it's likely he did. Bundy did not settle in Philadelphia, and after just a few months, returned to Washington State and rented a small apartment in Seattle from Ernest and Frieda Rogers, who, like everyone else who met him, viewed Ted as a model tenant, polite, helpful, and never rowdy. Bundy settled in Seattle and worked at a sawmill, and then as a messenger, in the autumn of 1969, he met a woman who was to remain in his life for the next six years. Her name was Liz Clofer, and although Bundy craved a normal relationship, and Liz became very important to him, throughout their time together, he secretly dated many other women. Initially, Liz rejected the intoxicated Bundy's advances, but after seeing him with another woman, she gave in to his good looks, dapper dress, and charm, and the two hit it off immediately although some of what Bundy told her about his life was a lie, as by this time, Bundy had become a compulsive liar. Liz was intrigued by Bundy and his unusual accent, said to be much closer to an Englishman than an American. Liz had a younger daughter from a previous marriage, and Bundy soon embraced his new family and thought he had found the normalness he craved. However, something stronger was still festering in his psychopathic mind, and despite this newfound connection, these heinous thoughts were still very much alive. Over the next few months, Ted and Liz's relationship grew, and they were both introduced to their respective families, who were pleased with the union. And although not officially living together, Ted spent most of his time at Liz's apartment. Liz, who was completely hooked, even helped to fund his return to university. And in the spring of 1970, 
Bundy again enrolled at the University of Washington and ironically declared his major in psychology. He also started working as a delivery driver for medical supplies, some of which he would steal and use in a grotesque way on his murder victims. Despite this newfound stability in his life, Bundy was still a masterful peeping Tom who stalked and spied on women at night for sexual gratification. And all the while, his fantasy of abducting and murdering a pretty young girl was getting stronger and stronger. Over the next few years, with Liz by his side, Ted transformed outwardly from the socially awkward failure to a confident, academically successful man. To those around him, he seemed to have a bright future ahead of him. And when in 1973, he was finally accepted into law school, he again caught the attention of his first love, Stephanie Brooks, who suddenly had a renewed interest in the man she had cruelly discarded. The two started to see each other again. However, unknown to Stephanie, this was just payback for Bundy. After all, he was still in a stable relationship with Liz. But this was his chance to reap revenge for her rejection and prove to himself he was good enough for her after all. Bundy did this by courting the unsuspected Stephanie and asking her to marry him, an offer she willingly accepted. Yet he had no intention of marrying her and not long after he dumped her. In his mind, it meant he had won in the end and the wrong had finally been made right. Bundy had sought the justice he thought he deserved. He carried on his life with Liz and to the outside world, he was a model of a successful, well-adjusted man who remained active in local politics and was a person people looked up to. He was even somewhat admired. But unbeknown to those around him, his urges were getting stronger and it was only a matter of time before he committed his first recorded crime. The respectable persona he had cocooned himself in was concealing the inner monster that was looming ever closer to the surface. In 1971, Bundy took a job as a telephone counselor at the Seattle Crisis Clinic, where he met crime writer Anne Rule, who went on to write a book about her co-worker, aptly named The Stranger Beside Me. In 1972, Bundy graduated with a degree in psychology. He then took a job at the Harborview Mental Health Center. This job did not work out as he was not considered capable of being emotionally responsive to the needs of the patients. He also had a brief relationship with one of his co-workers, a woman it would later transpire had a lucky escape as during their outings, he used to drive her to remote rural locations. It was also one of the few girls that Bundy admitted to Liz in their brief separation. Ted struggled with this separation and finally pleaded with Liz to take him back, declaring his love for her. Liz, who was hopelessly in love with Bundy, forgave him and the couple were reunited. Next, Ted became part of the team to re-elect Governor Dan Evans, a job Bundy reveled in as he was required to gain as much information as possible from Evans' opponent, Albert Rosalini. This sometimes involved wearing a disguise, something Bundy became renowned for during his murder spree. This new venture into politics saw Bundy rub shoulders with some of the most prominent figures in Washington state politics. But Bundy's nocturnal behavior was increasing and he would regularly roam the back streets at all hours of the night, planning his next move. Liz was also noticing a change in the man she adored. And on one occasion, she discovered surgical gloves in his pocket. Little did she know of the madness in her man's mind and the horrific consequences of it. His urges were now so strong that it was only a matter of time before he acted out his inhuman fantasies and what he had been planning most of his life. In 1973, after a brief and unsuccessful stint at the University of Puget Sound in Washington, Bundy made the decision to move to Utah the following summer and enter the University of Utah Law School. But by the end of 1973, and with the new year looming, Bundy's mind was focused and set. He was about to ignite a wave of terror unlike any other as he finally unleashed his sadistic thoughts and made them a reality, meaning no woman within his reach was safe. In January 1974, during one of his night stalks, Bundy entered the apartment of 18-year-old University of Washington student Karen Sparks. He bludgeoned the sleeping woman using a metal rod from under her bed frame. He then carried out a horrific sexual assault on the unconscious Karen, causing appalling internal injuries. Remarkably, she survived despite being unconscious for several days, but she was left with permanent disabilities. 
To spare her life was not Bundy's intention, and he would make sure that next time he was more thorough. This attack is thought to have been the trigger for the heinous events that followed, and kickstarted the raging sadistic fantasies that had been festering in Bundy's mind for most of his life. On the 31st of January 1974, 21-year-old student Linda Ann Healy was out enjoying a drink with friends at a local nightclub popular with students. At around 9.20pm, she walked home with friends to the house she shared with four others in the University District of 5517 12th Street. There, she settled in with her housemates and watched TV, then phoned her boyfriend before retiring to her bedroom in the basement. The house was a hub of activity, and as some of the residents had mislaid their keys, it wasn't uncommon for the front door to be left open into the early hours, something that wouldn't have gone unnoticed to a peeping Tom like Bundy. Nobody in the house heard a thing that night. They were not alerted to anything being wrong until Linda's alarm clock went off the next morning, and her employers called to ask why she hadn't turned up for work. After checking her room, her bed was uncharacteristically neatly made, but there was no sign of Linda. It wasn't until the evening that Linda's concerned parents alerted the police, who initially were not concerned, thinking it was just another unpredictable student who had made a spontaneous decision to visit someone without informing anyone. It wasn't until much later that night that they even searched her room after one of her roommates received three silent phone calls. After pulling back the covers of her bed, bloodstains were found and some clothes were missing. It was becoming apparent that someone had entered the house through the unlocked front door, attacked Linda, rendering her unconscious before hanging up her nightgown and gathering up a change of clothes before carrying her out into the night to an unknown location. From this point, no women within the area were safe. However, sadly for some, they were unaware of this. And that was the case for Bundy's next victim. Her name was Donna Gail Manson, a 19-year-old student from the Evergreen State College in Olympia. Donna had little interest in her studies and was an unpredictable, unreliable student who liked to party and often did not attend class. Her fondness of alcohol and marijuana would often make her vulnerable and she was known to hitchhike and stay out all night. On the evening of March the 12th, 1974, Donna left her dormitory at around 7 p.m. with the intention of attending a jazz concert held on campus. Sadly, she never made it. Donna vanished before reaching the campus, snatched by Bundy as she made her way to the gig. For her friends, her no-show and disappearance were typical of Donna, and she wasn't reported missing until seven days later. Just over a month later, a young lady called Kathleen Cara Dalivo had an unnerving encounter with a stranger in the car park at the Central State Washington College, where she was a student. It was around 10 p.m., and Kathleen had just left the library and started walking to her car when she heard the sound of something being dropped on the pavement. She turned around to see Bundy trying to pick up books. He had his arm in a sling and was dressed as a student might. Kathleen helped the man, who seemed to be struggling, and carried his books to his car, an old brown Volkswagen Beetle. Kathleen became nervous and realized that she may be in danger, and after reaching the car, she made a hasty retreat she had a very lucky escape. But it seems that Bundy was frustrated that his intended victim had escaped and so went in search of another. That unfortunate girl was 18-year-old fellow student, Suzanne Elaine Rancourt, who disappeared on her way back from her dorm on the same night in the same area that Kathleen had encountered Bundy. It transpired later that another girl had a similar encounter with a stranger wearing a sling and dropping books. Although it's unclear if it was the same night, it was the same area and most definitely the same person. By now, unlike with the disappearance of Donna, the local press and police department were starting to take notice. And although at this stage, it was considered a case of missing persons, a pattern was emerging. Bundy seemed to be picking off victims of similar appearance. Young with long hair parted in the middle, and much later it was realized they all bore a resemblance to his first love, Stephanie. Now that Bundy's inner beast had been unleashed, the facade of normality that he had always displayed to the outside world was also melting away. People started to notice a change in his personality. His long partner Liz also noted his behavior towards her was getting more and more perverse, 
and as she wanted no part of it, he became moody and preoccupied. She became convinced that he had met another woman. Little did she know that his mind was now consumed with murder. And on one occasion, the increasingly deranged Bundy, without warning, pushed Liz out of the raft they were traveling in, into the freezing water of the Yakamini. This was the day Liz saw a different side of the man she had loved and stood by all these years. And for the first time, she witnessed the murderer within Bundy that he had been hiding from her. It was the beginning of the end for their relationship. Bundy was becoming more and more elusive, and as the physical exertion of his murders started to take its toll, he also started skipping work and missing appointments. With the growing media attention the missing women were receiving in Washington state, Bundy, who was an avid reader of anything that concerned his victims, decided it was time to travel further afield for his next victim. He chose Oregon. 21-year-old Oregon State University student, Roberta Parks, had a troubling few days. She had received news that her father had had a heart attack, and she was having serious thoughts about what future she had with her long-term boyfriend. This coupled with her increasing unhappiness with the direction of her life was going, left her feeling uncertain and a little depressed about her future. To unravel and make sense of her thoughts, it wasn't unusual for Kathy to go for walks alone at night. Sadly for her, on the night of the 6th of May 1974, this solitary walk proved to be fatal, and that night, Roberta disappeared without a trace. On the night of May the 31st, 1974, Bundy spent the evening with Liz, Tina, and her parents. They ate pizza in town and then returned to Liz's place, but Ted was edgy and seemed anxious to leave. Over in the nearby Flame Tavern, 22-year-old Brenda Carol Ball was enjoying an evening drinking with friends. Brenda had dropped out of college and was just enjoying life. Similar to Donna Manson, Brenda was taking risks. She would often hitchhike and often frequented bars, drinking until late into the night. In the early hours of June the 1st, Brenda, who had failed to secure a lift home, left the Flame Tavern. Some reports claimed with an unknown man, but one thing for certain, sometime after she left, she encountered Bundy and was brutally murdered and abused. However, due to the drifting nature of her lifestyle, she was not reported missing until June the 17th, by which time Bundy had struck again. His next victim was 18-year-old Georgian Hawkins, a popular and hard-working first-year student at the University of Washington. In the early hours of June the 11th, Hawkins had just dropped in to visit her boyfriend after attending a frat party. Unlike Bundy's other victims, she was well aware of the dangers of walking at night alone, and rarely did so. But on this occasion, she decided to take the short walk in the well-lit alley towards her home. Just yards away from her home, she encountered an apparently disabled man who had a leg brace and crutches and was struggling with a briefcase. Being a kind-hearted soul, Georgian seeing no danger, agreed to help the struggling man back to his car, the brown Volkswagen Beetle. Georgian was abducted, killed, and subject to a sadistic sexual assault before and after death. But unlike on previous occasions, Bundy had left evidence. He'd struck her with such force before abducting her that she lost a shoe and both her earrings flew out. Items Bundy calmly retrieved the next morning. Bundy was now out of control, and he was becoming arrogant, reveling in the fear he was creating. There were now six women missing, as well as the unsolved beating of Karen Sparks, and the incidents were now making headlines in Washington and Oregon. The pressure was mounting on the authorities to act, and for Bundy, being the talk of the town excited him, and made his murderous urges even stronger. This resulted in one of his most audacious acts to date, it was a sunny day on Sunday, July the 14th, 1974, and families and tourists descending onto the beach at Lake Sammamish State Park in Issaquah, 20 miles east of Seattle. One of those visitors was 23-year-old Prohibition officer and Issaquah resident, Janice Ann Ott, who placed her towel and belongings, including her yellow bike on the beach, and settled down for a day of sunbathing. Janice had recently separated from her husband and described herself as a liberated woman. Visitors to the beach that day couldn't help but notice an attractive, polite young man in a white tennis outfit 
and his arm in a sling, meandering between the hundreds of sunbathers, apparently looking for someone. At around midday, he sat down beside the bikini-clad Janice, and the two struck up a conversation. Witnesses claimed that the man introduced himself as Ted, and asked Janice if she would help him put his sailboat in his car. It later transpired that he had asked several women that day the same thing, but most of them had refused. Tragically for Janice, she agreed to help and packed up her things and the pair headed towards the brown Volkswagen Beetle. As Janice stepped into the car and Bundy drove to a secluded area, she would become completely unaware of the nightmare that awaited. He had an urge to kill again, and such was his confidence, now he was willing to take unprecedented risks in broad daylight to satisfy his cravings. At around 4pm, he made his way back down to the crowds and went on the prowl again. Bundy approached several young women, again with the sailboat story, but was rebuffed on at least three occasions. He persisted, and it was only a matter of time before he snatched up his next victim. At around 4.30pm, 18-year-old Dennis Nasland left her sleeping friends on the beach and made her way to the restroom. She was a bit unsteady, as she had been drinking and taking drugs earlier in the day. As she left the bathroom, she stopped and spoke to a man with a sling on his arm. This was the last anyone seen of Denise, and she disappeared without a trace. The police and public were now in a frenzy, and despite there still not being any physical evidence, the police now had a description of their suspect, as well as the possible vehicle he drove, and the name Ted. Despite this breakthrough, and many of Bundy's associates actually putting his name forward, he evaded capture for a further 15 months, in which time he moved freely from state to state, killing at will. Just a few weeks after the Lake Salmonish abductions, at the beginning of September 1974, Bundy moved to Salt Lake City to start at the University of Utah Law School. Liz did not move with him, she stayed in Seattle with Tina, and as was the pattern throughout their relationship, Ted dated at least a dozen other women, while still maintaining contact with Liz. Before he left to Seattle, he had also dated Carol Ann Boone, a lady he met while working at the Washington State Department of Emergency Services, and as well as Liz, Boone became an important part of his life. Bundy would take his next victim on the drive to his new home in Utah, whilst driving on 84 going east through Idaho. He stopped and made a brief phone call to Liz, shortly after he continued his journey, and around 30 minutes later, just outside the city of Bozy, Bundy spotted a hitchhiker. He pulled over in his brown Volkswagen and offered the young girl a lift. Without hesitation, she accepted the lift from the smiling good-looking stranger, completely oblivious to the fact this would be the last ride of her life. As they drove and chatted for around three hours, Bundy would pull off the highway and bludgeon the girl with a crowbar he kept under his seat, and while she was still alive, drag her unconscious body to the side of his car, where he carried out the most heinous sexual assault, strangling the girl during the act. He would then stay with the corpse and again defile her body. He then threw her body and her clothes in the river and burned her ID. This poor young lady was never identified and her remains were never recovered. After the killing, Bundy proceeded calmly on his way. He finally arrived in Salt Lake City in the early hours of September the 3rd, 1974. His intentions was to replicate in Utah what he had started in Washington State. But the net was closing in, and just five days after Bundy arrived in Utah, two of his victims' bodies were found, those of Denise Nesland and Janice Ott, along with a third set of unidentified human bones. Their remains were discovered by a hunter in a secluded area less than 10 miles from Sammamish State Park. The discoveries confirmed the worst fears of the police and the community. The missing girls were now murder victims, and there was a serial madman living amongst them. The man in charge of solving these heinous crimes was Detective Robert Capel. After settling into his new home in Salt Lake City, Bundy became a hit with his new neighbours, although he didn't settle into universities quite as well, and was sporadic in his attendance. He later confessed he found the classes completely incomprehensible and a great disappointment. Between the 20th of September and the 8th of November 1974, Bundy would abduct and murder at least four women. 
He was now far away from the frenzied investigation in Washington State, and was free to fulfill the most desirable thing in his life, the need to commit murder. The first known murder during this period was on October the 2nd, when Bundy abducted 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox from a suburb in Salt Lake City. He dragged her into a wooded area where he assaulted and strangled her, before burying her 200 miles away, somewhere near Capitol Reef National Park, although her remains have never been found. His next victim was 17-year-old Melissa Smith, who disappeared on October the 18th after leaving a pizza parlor. Melissa was the daughter of a local police chief, and her body was found nine days after her abduction in a mountainous area close to where she had been last seen. Less than two weeks later, 17-year-old Lehigh Emmy also went missing, and her body was found nine miles away in American Fork Canyon. Both women had been beaten and subject to vile rapes before being strangled with nylon stockings. However, unlike some of his other victims, it was thought likely Bundy kept these two alive, most likely unconscious, and used their lifeless bodies as playthings for his own sexual gratification, possibly taking them back to his apartment until he finally finished them off and dumped their bodies. Bundy seemed to be pushing the boundaries even further in his relentless pursuit of his euphoria, and it was thought that both Lehi and Melissa had been washed and had makeup and nail polish applied to them by Bundy, either pre or post-mortem. The final known victim during this six-week killing spree was 17-year-old Deborah Kent, a student at Viewmont High School in Bountiful. However, before Deborah met her horrific end, Bundy had unsuccessfully tried to abduct another girl, 18-year-old telephone operator Carol Daronge. This time, Bundy posed as Officer Rosland of the Murray Police Department. After luring Carol into his Volkswagen, she realized she was in danger and put up a strong fight. She managed to escape when Bundy bungled his attempt at handcuffing her. After the incident, Ted was frustrated and in predatory mode, and there was only one way to alleviate this. He immediately sought another victim. As he headed towards Bountiful, he remembered that Viewmont High School was hosting a musical. He saw this as a perfect opportunity. He parked his Volkswagen in the school parking lot and scanned the area before making the brazen decision to enter the school auditorium. His presence didn't go unnoticed, and many recall the good-looking stranger milling among them that night. The concert was overrunning, and Deborah Kent, who was sat with her family, had to leave to pick up her brother. As soon as Bundy spotted her, he made his move. As she walked to her car, he pounced and by unknown means rendered Deborah unconscious before carrying her to his car. Then, in order to divert suspicion from himself, he returned to the auditorium. In the audience that night was Susan Curtis, who would also become one of Bundy's victims. As the Kent family filtered out of the performance that night, they could not have realized that their lives would never be the same again, and that their precious daughter was now far away, bundled into Bundy's Volkswagen, with untold horror awaiting her. Deborah's body was never recovered. Outside the auditorium, investigators found a key that unlocked the handcuffs removed from Carol Daronch's wrists. Back in Seattle, Bundy's girlfriend Liz read an article about the young women that were disappearing in the towns surrounding Salt Lake City. When details of the Samish Lake murders were released, Liz contacted King County Police and relayed her suspicions about the man she loved. But at that time, no credible evidence linked him to the Utah crimes or the Samish Lake incidents. But just as Washington State was living in fear, so now was Utah. The entire population of both areas were looking over their shoulder in a constant state of nervousness and dread as to who would be the next victim. This was something Bundy took great pleasure in, and he scrolled the newspapers for the next installment of his murderous reign. 1975 wasn't going to be a good one for Bundy, as suspicion was growing, though this did not suppress his burning desire to kill. At the start of the year, Bundy briefly returned to Seattle to spend the week with Liz, but despite her suspicions, she made no reference to the killings, or the fact that she had now reported him to police on three separate occasions. But by this time, Liz was becoming more and more convinced in her mind 
that the man she loved was a brutal serial killer. She desperately wanted to believe he wasn't, and she methodically went through the dates of the killings, comparing them to Bundy's movements on those days and the phone calls to her. This gave her some reassurance, as on most of these days, she recalls Bundy had seemed normal. So surely if he had been out killing young girls and committing heinous acts of necrophilia, there would be some clues in his demeanor on the many phone calls he had made to her. But this was Ted Bundy. He was not normal. He was a sociopath who would flick a switch in his mind, turning from monster to charming young man in a matter of hours. When Bundy returned to Salt Lake City after his week with Liz, he decided he would need to travel further afield for his next victims. Utah State was getting too risky. He'd created a reign of terror throughout the state and it was time to move on. He chose Colorado. After all, he was an accomplished skier and he would blend in nicely with the community there, a community who would only barely be aware of the killings in Washington and Utah. In January 1975, 23-year-old nurse Karen Aline Campbell arrived at Wildwood Inn in Snowmass Village near Aspen, Colorado, with her boyfriend Raymond and his children. He had come to attend a medical conference and Karen was going to spend her day skiing with the kids. On the evening of the 12th of January, Karen left the lobby of the Wildwood Inn to go to her room to get a magazine. Her boyfriend and the children stayed downstairs. She took the elevator to her second floor room, but she never made it. As she stepped out of the elevator, Bundy was waiting. Karen's frozen, naked, partially eaten body was found over a month later, two and a half miles away from the south side of Owl Creek Road. She had extensive injuries to her head, face and neck, consistent with being struck with a blunt instrument. For the next couple of months, Bundy returned to his studies in Utah, although as usual, his attendance was irregular. For the police, an important discovery was made when on March the 1st, 1975, two forestry students stumbled upon a macabre scene on the slopes of Taylor Mountain. After police did an extensive search of the area, the full horror of Bundy's crimes emerged. The heads of Linda Healy, Kathy Parks, Susan Rancourt, and Brenda Ball were discovered. All of the upper teeth of Kathy Parks were missing, and Susan Rancourt's hair was found detached from her head and part of Brenda Bull's skull was missing. These discoveries were horrific, and for the families of the missing, quashed any hope of finding their loved ones alive. It was also apparent that Bundy had used this place as a dumping ground for heads, and in some cases, had traveled a considerable distance to this location. The question was, where were the rest of the remains? Only Bundy knew that, and he was not in any hurry to reveal it. After all, in his mind, he still had work to do. On March the 14th, Bundy left his apartment in Utah and again headed to Colorado. The long scenic drive ahead gave him time to think and plan his next move as his homicidal cravings grew stronger. The calendar had ticked over to the 15th when Bundy arrived in his Volkswagen at the small village of Vail in Colorado. At around 9 p.m. that evening, 26-year-old part-time ski instructor, Julie Cunningham, left her apartment to take the short walk to a nearby tavern where she was due to meet friends. En route, she encountered a man walking with crutches and struggling with his ski equipment. He asked the young lady for help getting to his car and Julie willingly agreed. She was never seen alive again. Bundy bludgeoned her and took her to a secluded area where he sexually assaulted her and dumped her naked body under a tree. Bundy later admitted he drove back to the dead body on more than one occasion in the following days and committed necrophilia before finally burying her. Her body was never found. Bundy was on the road again, and on April the 6th, 24-year-old Denise Oliverson disappeared near the Utah-Colorado border in Grand Junction. Denise had had an argument with her boyfriend and had decided to ride a yellow bike over to her parents' house. Somewhere en route, Bundy abducted her, killed her, and dumped her body in the Colorado River. It's unclear if Bundy was disrupted or thought it was too risky as it was unusual for him to dump a body this way as he liked to return to the corpse later. Her body was never recovered, but her bike and sandals were. On his return to Salt Lake City, Bundy remembered to send Liz flowers for her 30th birthday. 
Although this thoughtful gesture did nothing to alleviate the growing fear and confusion in Liz's mind that her lover was potentially a sadistic serial killer. However, despite reporting her concerns again to the police, they seemed no closer to apprehending him, even though he was on their list of 100 suspects. The four states that Bundy had now struck in were starting to compare notes and a pattern was emerging. It was their belief that it was possible that a single perpetrator was responsible for all of the known murders and disappearances. At the beginning of May, Ted was on the hunt again. This time he headed north towards Idaho. By his standards, quite a short run of around 160 miles. He checked into a Holiday Inn close to Idaho State University. And for the first time since his killing spree, he was actually confronted by a man when he was caught entering a female dormitory. When he was unable to confirm his identity, he was asked to leave. The first night in this area was a frustrating one for Bundy and he returned to his hotel room, dejected at his inability to track down a victim. This was very bad news for 12-year-old Lynette Culver, as the next day, in a complete change of tactics for Bundy, he got into his Volkswagen and started prowling the streets when he came across a group of schoolchildren on lunch break. Bundy parked his car close to the school and got into a conversation with Lynette, who, for whatever reason, got into the passenger seat of his car. Bundy then drove her back to the Holiday Inn and drowned her in the bathtub. He was now not only an unrelented killer of women, he was also a paedophile and child murderer. Bundy dumped her body in a river north of the area the next day. Bundy returned to his life in Utah, and in the middle of that month, he had a visitor from his old job in Washington State. These included Carol Ann Boone. They all stayed in Bundy's apartment for the week. A few weeks after they left, Bundy made a surprise visit to Liz, who was, as usual, delighted to see him. It's thought they even discussed marriage, even though Liz still had deep-seated fears that he was involved in the killings. Similarly, Bundy never disclosed the fact that he was still having an ongoing relationship with Carol Boone. By the end of June, he craved another dead body. As with his previous victim, he chose a child. Her name was Susan Curtis, a young girl who had been in the audience the night Bundy abducted Deborah Jean Kent from Viewmont High School in Bountiful. On June the 27th, 15-year-old Susan vanished from the campus of Brigham Young University in Provo. As she walked alone, Bundy emerged from the darkness, luring her to her death. Her body was never recovered. In the months that followed, a young girl from Golden, Colorado named Shelley Robertson went missing, along with 23-year-old Nancy Bayard, who disappeared from her place of work. Although Bundy did not admit to the killing of these two girls, it's entirely plausible he was responsible, as he was known to frequent both these places. Shelley's decomposed body was found in an old mine shaft 40 miles west of Golden, and Nancy has never been located. Meanwhile, back in Washington State, investigators were analyzing the many leads that they had compiled, and out of the thousands of names put forward, one that was consistently matching was Theodore Robert Bundy. In the early hours of August the 16th, 1975, Bundy was parked up smoking weed in his Volkswagen. He had spent the night cruising around, most likely in search of a girl. The blinding lights of Sergeant Bob Hayward's patrol car were about to startle him, and in an uncharacteristic lapse of judgment, Bundy decided to take off, closely pursued by Hayward. Eventually, Bundy surrendered and prepared himself to go on the charm offensive. This was the moment that Bundy's murderous world started to implode. For the first time, he had become the hunted rather than the hunter. Bundy was arrested that night for evading an officer and being in possession of burglary tools. Handcuffs were also found in the boot, which were in fact part of his murderous toolkit, containing a ski mask, pantyhose, a crowbar, handcuffs, bags, rope, an ice pick, and other items. After being booked, Bundy was released on his own recognizance. His murder bag was seized and kept as evidence. This was to be the beginning of the end. By now, Bundy had risen to the top of the suspect list, and as the various states started talking, all of the dots were starting to join up. On August the 21st, 1975, Bundy was arrested at his home in Utah and taken to the police station. He was questioned at length about the contents of the bag, but even the officer found it hard to believe that the nice guy presented to them could possibly be anything other than just that. 
but his demeanour was about to change, and the ever-confident Bundy was about to make mistakes in his recollection of events, and his lifetime of lies were about to unravel. Officers searched his home and found a guide to Colorado ski resorts and a brochure advertising the Viewmont High School play in Bountiful, but nothing sufficiently incriminating to hold him any longer, and after photographing his car, he was again released, but all the pieces were now coming together as officers from the three states where Bundy had committed crimes compared notes. Bob in Seattle, Mike Fisher in Aspen, and Jerry Thompson in Salt Lake City. And now, what was once three separate investigations was one. Crucial pieces of evidence were going to seal the deal, and it would come from one that got away, Carol DeRange. After she was shown photos of the Volkswagen Beetle and a mugshot of Bundy, Carol thought it was the man posing as Officer Rosalind on that terrifying day back in 1974. More importantly, she also agreed to attend a lineup. Shortly after his release, Bundy sold his Volkswagen Beetle to a teenager, but the vehicle was impounded by the police, dismantled and searched, and despite Bundy being obsessive about cleaning the car, they were able to retrieve hair matching samples obtained from Karen Campbell, Melissa Smith and Carol DeRange. On October the 2nd, 1975, Bundy was put in a lineup and was immediately identified by DeRange as the man who tried to abduct her. He was also picked out by witnesses from Bountiful, who recognised him as the unknown stranger lurking around the Viewmont School Auditorium on the night Deborah Kent disappeared. Despite there being insufficient evidence to link him to Deborah's murder at the time, there was more than enough to charge him for the attempted abduction of DeRange. Bundy was arrested and charged, but freed on $15,000 bail paid by his parents. Whilst on bail, Bundy was under heavy surveillance, and he returned to Seattle, where a lot of his old friends and colleagues believed in his innocence. He also set about wooing Liz back, and it succeeded, because although in the past she had spoken extensively to the police in December of that year, it was reported that she would no longer be cooperating with the authorities. Bundy had won her, and she now believed he was innocent. For the next few months, until his trial in February 1976, Bundy played cat and mouse with the authorities as they tried to keep tabs on him. They were convinced he was their murderer, but there was insufficient evidence at the moment to pin any of it on him. At his trial, he was found guilty of the kidnap and assault of DeRange. The courtroom was packed with not only many of Bundy's supporters, but also members of the families whose daughters had been horrifically murdered. Proof that despite not being tried or even arrested for their murders, there was little doubt they thought he was responsible. In June 1976, he was sentenced to serve a minimum of one to a maximum of 15 years in Utah State Prison. Bundy protested his innocence, and for the first time, he was finally off the streets and locked away. And all the while, Keppel, Fisher and Thompson were tirelessly working with dog determination to find enough evidence to build a case against Bundy and prove once and for all he was a killer. In October 1976, Colorado authorities charged Bundy with Carolyn Campbell's murder, and in the early hours of a freezing morning on the 28th of January 1977, Bundy was cuffed and shackled, then bundled into an unmarked police car to make the final journey from Utah to Colorado to stand trial. Ironically, it was a journey he knew well, it was his hunting ground, but this time he was getting a taste of his own medicine. As soon as Bundy arrived at the old, slightly run-down jail at Pitkin County Courthouse, he again started to turn on the charm, and even the jailers found it hard to believe he was capable of what he was being accused of. The ever-arrogant Bundy also opted to assist in his own defence, an action that Bundy would have been well aware of would give him access to the law library and other special privileges. He was later moved from Pitkin to Glenwood Spring Jail, 40 miles away, meaning he had to be transported for his hearings. The ever-cunning Bundy now only had one thing on his mind, how he could use this to his advantage and plan his escape. That moment came in June 1977, when Bundy asked to visit the courthouse law library to research his case. He opened a window and jumped from the second floor, spraining his right ankle as he landed, but he was once again free. It didn't last long, as just six days later, he was pulled over in a car he had stolen and was recaptured. Having a taste of freedom, Bundy was now intent on making another escape bid. 
and after meticulous planning and help from inmates and visitors. In particular, Carol Ann Boone, he acquired a hacksaw and $500. After losing 35 pounds, he cut a hole in the ceiling of his cell and wriggled through the crawl space. On the night of the 30th of December, 1977, he again successfully escaped. It was not noticed until 17 hours later, by which time he had made it to Chicago. In a shocking twist, the madman was at large again, and he had one thing on his mind. Despite admitting later that his initial intention was to get a job and dissolve undetected into society, the urge to kill was too strong. And after making his way to Florida, less than a week later, on January the 15th, 1978, Bundy went on a rampage. He entered Florida State University's Chi Omega Sorority House through a rear door with a faulty lock. He then proceeded to bludgeon 21-year-old Margaret Bowman before choking her with a nylon stocking. He then entered the bedroom of 20-year-old Lisa Levy and beat her unconscious, then sexually assaulted her. In an adjoining bedroom, he attacked Kathy Kleiner, breaking her jaw, then moved on to Karen Chandler. These frenzied attacks took place in the space of just 15 minutes. After leaving the house, Bundy broke into an apartment eight blocks away and attacked student Cheryl Thomas, causing extensive head injuries. She was left with permanent deafness. On her bed, police found bodily fluids and a pantyhose mask containing two hairs matched to Bundy's. By now, Bundy, who was going by the name Chris Hagen, was living on stolen credit cards and living at boarding houses near the Florida State University. He was also on the FBI list of the 10 most wanted people. Just a few weeks later, Bundy stole a van and drove 100 miles to Jacksonville, where he approached 14-year-old Leslie Parmenter in a parking lot. She had a lucky escape as Bundy retreated when Leslie's older brother arrived. But this left Bundy frustrated and that afternoon, he drove 60 miles to Lake City, where he stayed the night. The next morning, 12-year-old Kimberly Leach disappeared from her school. Seven weeks later, after an extensive search, her partially mummified remains were found in a pig shed 35 miles away. Just a few days later, Bundy, aware that the police were on his tail, stole a car and headed west across the Florida panhandle. Three days later, at around 1am, he was stopped by a police officer, David Lee. After a struggle, Bundy was finally apprehended. In his stolen vehicle, with three sets of IDs belonging to female FSU students and 21 stolen credit cards. At the time, Lee was unaware that he had captured one of the most wanted fugitives in America. He recalls that while driving Bundy to the police station, he said, I wish you had killed me. Bundy knew it was over for him, and although he kept the pretense of false identity, it was only a matter of time before he was unmasked. But the ever manipulator would only reveal his true identity on his terms, and that included negotiating the use of a telephone for a two hour period. He used part of that time to call Liz, and he warned her when the news broke, it was going to be big. In the subsequent call to Liz, he also explained his actions as a sickness he couldn't control. She realized at this point that her suspicion had been correct all along. Bundy was charged and stood trial in Miami for the Chi Omega homicides and assaults. The trial was front page news and was the first trial that was televised nationally in the US. But as in previous hearings, Bundy wanted to control and insisted on handling his own defense. This was a fatal mistake. After all, he was in Florida now, and he was facing a death sentence. In a bizarre move, Bundy rejected a plea bargain that would have him plead guilty in return for a 75-year prison sentence. Instead, he chose to go on trial. However, the evidence was overwhelming, and the jury deliberated for less than seven hours before convicting him on July the 24th, 1979, of the murders of Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy. All three counts of attempted first degree murder of Kathy Klein, Karen Chandler, and Cheryl Thomas, as well as two counts of burglary. Trial judge Edward Cowart imposed death sentences for the murder convictions. But Bundy, despite knowing he had murdered at least 36 innocent women, refused to show any remorse or acknowledge his guilt, telling Judge Cowart, I find it somewhat absurd to ask for mercy for something I did not do. 
So I will be tortured for, and suffer for, and receive the pain for the act, but I will not share the burden of guilt. Judge Cowart then proceeded to sentence Bundy to death by electric chair. Bundy would now fight for his life, just like his poor terrified victims. But ultimately, despite years of appeals, the outcome was inevitable. In 1980, a second trial took place in Orlando for the abduction and murder of Kimberly Leach. Bundy was again found guilty. On February the 9th, 1980, during the penalty phase of his trial, Bundy took advantage of an obscure Florida law, stating that a marriage declaration made in court in the presence of a judge constituted a legal marriage. Using this law, Bundy asked Carol Ann Boone to marry him. She was in the court testifying on his behalf. She readily accepted, and Bundy declared to the court that they were legally married. The next day, Bundy was sentenced to death by electrocution for the third time. As the sentence was announced, he reportedly stood and shouted, tell the jury they were wrong. In 1982, Boone gave birth to a daughter and named Bundy as the father. In the aftermath of his convictions, Bundy underwent multiple psychiatric examinations in an attempt to understand what makes a man commit such vile acts. But even the experts had a tough time trying to unravel the complex mind of Ted Bundy. He would often blame others for his actions, including his abusive grandfather, the fact that his true parentage was kept from him, and even the police, who he claims planted evidence. He also blamed the media, TV, alcohol, pornography, and even his victims. In fact, he blamed everything and everybody except himself. The conclusions about Bundy's mental condition varied, with some believing he was bipolar, others antisocial personality disorder, but there is no doubt he was a psychopath. As with his victims, he was able to manipulate even the experts, and he never showed an ounce of remorse for what he had done. On July the 2nd, 1986, Bundy is 15 minutes from being executed. When he obtains a stay of execution, another attempt is made in November that same year. In a feeble attempt to try and earn another stay of execution, Bundy offers to reveal details of the murders he hadn't been convicted of. He gave details of the murders of Carolyn Campbell and Julie Cunningham. Although initially, he refused to discuss Denise Oliverson. In total, he confessed to 30 homicides over seven states between 1974 and 1978. And as he was being led to the electric chair, he admitted to the murder of Denise. But in a slap in the face to the families of his many other victims, he neither admitted or revealed where the missing remains were. This was his final act of torture. The true victim count is almost certainly much higher. Theodore Robert Bundy was executed at 7.16 a.m. on January the 24th, 1989. The death of a true madman left more questions than answers, as was his wish throughout his heinous life. Bundy remained control until the end, taking with him the secrets of what he did with the bodies, and leaving their loved ones with the indescribable pain they would have to live with for the rest of their lives.